It goes by many names, and it is seen all over the world. In 1978, retired Air Force veteran George was on leave from the base. He decided to go camping in the back of his truck. One night, while sitting in the back of the camper, he was awoken. And then uh, I was awoken by the truck shaking side to side. And then I, I looked through, through the rear window of the, the camper shell, and I saw this thing there. You know, I, I didn't know what it was. In Afghanistan, several high-ranking U.S. officials had met with a Taliban leader. A honcho, like an older man, um, a contact, a go-between, an indigenous person who had some juice uh, in the area. To lighten the mood, a sergeant asks the Taliban warlord if he's ever seen a Yeti. And the interpreter turned to the sergeant. He was like, um, yes, of course he knows what you're talking about. And what he ends up saying is like, yes, of course I've seen this thing that you've talked about out, out here. I grew up, I've been seeing it ever since I was a kid. I grew up with this thing. And I hate this thing. We all hate this thing because when I was young, we saw it all the time. And it would come and it would occasionally steal livestock and would frighten our women. And when we had chances, we would shoot at it with our with our Kalashnikovs. And the name that they have for it isn't like... Um, it's not some romantic name like, you know, Big Man of the Woods or any shit like that. It's like the nick, the local name that they have for it is like Dirt Thing or like Pest Thing. It's like a very pejorative name that they have for this. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved, uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. My name is Maximus Decimus Meridius, commander of the armies of the North, general of the Felix Legions, and you are listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you. Uh, we're going to be chatting with George. And George actually comes to us from California. Uh, he served in the Air Force. And uh, gosh, over 40 years ago, he was on leave from the base. He decided to go camping. And George told me, you know, I've, I've never been an outdoorsman. I, I grew up in a kind of a gang area, high crime, a lot of bad people around. And I'd just never been out in the woods and taking this opportunity to leave the base, I wanted to go enjoy the forest. And so George will be sharing his encounters with us tonight. We're also gonna be chatting with Jack and Jack was there in the intro. 
he served our country. He was in Afghanistan, and there was a big meeting with uh, one of these Taliban leaders. And to kind of lighten the mood, or in a joking way, a sergeant said to the man, "Have you ever seen a Yeti?" And uh, it was very surprising the answer he gave. So Jack will be going into that tonight. Uh, what's fascinating is, you know, out there in Pakistan, um, you know, we call it Bigfoot Sasquatch. Uh, in China, it's the urine. In um, Russia, it's the Almas. And what's fascinating is in Pakistan, it's the Barmanu. And the way the Pakistanis describe the Barmanu is it holds both human and ape-like characteristics. And a lot of its behavior is very similar to what we experience here in the States. Uh, if you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Jack to the show. Jack, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Jack, I appreciate you being here, and thank you for your service. If you would, kind of tell us about Afghanistan, and then walk us into this conversation. Yeah, um, uh, the year that this happened was 2003, and I was serving in a, um, a special operations unit. And we were in a very, very remote part of Afghanistan very early in the war. We were on a, uh, a sort of a long range, uh, I wouldn't say a patrol, but we were on a long range presence patrol. And it was my unit of guys. It was a small unit of guys. And we also had um, representatives from um, other government agencies with us, as well as an interpreter and a sort of little, a little group of guys together in what um, is referred to as like a little task force. But we were even smaller than that. And we were operating in a very, very remote part of Afghanistan. That's when this all happened. And at the time, um, I, was a, I was a very low ranking guy. I was like not some, you know, I wasn't some high ranking dude or anything like that. And um, I happened to be involved in this incident because um, our leadership, our little localized group of leadership, needed a couple bodies to come with them as a personal security detail. Um, in the military, we call that a PTSD. So uh, when this incident happened, I was a young guy who was, hey, you, come here. And I was basically serving as a, um, as a, like a, a bodyguard or an assistant to our command group uh, when this happened. We were operating in an area that up till that point uh in the war the the taliban used to retreat up into um the mountains in afghanistan during the winter time to refit and rearm and refuel sort of like a um sort of like a reverse valley forge type thing that they had up there and this is a t technique that the uh that the afghanis have been using from you know untold centuries the terrain is so difficult and so vertical and so remote there's really no corollary for it in the Western Hemisphere whatsoever. Um, and this is up above the Hindu Kush, and uh, it's extremely remote, and it's extremely vertical. And um, it kind of looks like uh, it kind of looks like the Rocky Mountains. There's a lot of small game. There's like a, um, a huge proliferation of mountain little little like uh, mountain goats there. There's no real megafauna there at all, and there's tons and tons and tons of like um, streams and freshwater and like uh, I don't know if they're glaciers or not, but they certainly are like like massive draws that are full of snow that melts and then turns into these little wadis and stuff like that. So it's really um, it's very very rugged country, um, and it's very vertical and it's extremely remote. At this point in the war, American forces had not established a presence on the ground yet. So um, it was decided that there needed to be a group of uh, very physically tough, uh, very <laughs> capable, very motivated guys who would go up and, and hump up in these mountains. And um, we would show the Taliban that, yes, um, even in your winter stronghold, we can, we can um, you know, pursue you and execute the mission. So um, fortunately slash unfortunately, I was in this group of guys and uh, we were we were we flew up there and we established a presence. We spent a lot of time walking around in these mountains and um, it was very, very difficult. We went over 14,000, over 16,000 feet like numerous times. We established a presence and on one of these missions, our command group 
was going to make contact with a very high ranking uh, local Afghani warlord, or I don't know if warlord maybe is the best term, but a very high ranking, a honcho, like an older man, a contact, a go between an indigenous person who had some juice uh, in the area. I think warlord is probably a pretty apt term for what this person was, but I don't know if that's the specific term or not. But um, we went up there and um, we had our commanding officer and we had our senior ranking sergeant and we had um, uh, an interpreter with us and um, our interpreter was a westernized person who spoke Pashti. He wasn't a native Pashti who spoke English. So our interpreter was familiar with Western, you know, media and customs and things like that. And then we had a couple of people with us that were not military, but they were members of other government agencies. And these people were collecting information. And in exchange for that information, they were exchanging large amounts of, uh, of currency with these, with these Afghan people. So this was going to be a very, very serious meeting in which armed special forces operators were going to meet with local Taliban, not Taliban connections, but people that were connected to the Taliban. And we were going to exchange with them large amounts of money to get information that would allow us to further execute our mission. So this is like, you know, the most, most high stakes stuff that's going on. We were not there to, um, you know, dig wells or, or give vaccines to children. We were there on a very, uh, just solely combat, um, oriented mission. So, um, the area that we were in was extremely, um, it, it was extremely dense coniferous forest, uh, with a lot of big, big old growth. I mean, they looked, you know, I don't know if they, I don't, they weren't cedars, but they kind of looked like cedars and, um, there was no underbrush and there was tons of, of, of like streams and, and flowing water all around. And, um, from what I remember is we were kind of like at where the timber line stops. I'm not sure what the elevation is where the timber line stops is. I think it's 11,000 feet, but we were right at that. Um, we were right at that transitionary zone where the timber line stops. And we met this person in a hut, a small hut that had uh, plastic sheeting windows. We went into this, uh, we went into this little hut and this, this old, 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 ancient-looking man was sitting there, uh, cross-legged, and um, you know those people live a very different different lifestyle than ours. They live a very difficult lifestyle. So this man looked as though he could have been 150 years old, but who knows? He might have only been 60. Um, these people in these remote areas live extremely difficult lifestyles compared to our, our Western lifestyle. And this man was sitting in this hut and he had a couple of his representatives with him and they all looked like they were fighting age men. And there were um, Kalashnikov rifles, there were RPGs in this room and there was a bunch of like uh, blankets and pillows on the floor. And this man was sitting cross-legged um, very comfortably behind a, a very large serving plate, that, like a silver serving dish that was on the ground. His representatives were uh, seated behind him, and our command structure sat down at this large serving, desk, uh, this large serving dish. And uh, they were getting comfortable, and they were very classically breaking bread together. And they were going to discuss the terms of this very important meeting as they had uh, roti and rice, you know, some flatbread and rice. Me being a young guy, I was standing in the back trying to, my best to look tough. And uh, I was, you know, I was in the same room with all these men. I want to, like, let you know and whoever's listening to this, um, these people in this region, they don't have uh, electricity. Uh, most of them don't have plumbing or running water or anything like that. They don't listen to the radio. They don't have televisions. They don't have DVDs. If any of them have heard recorded media in their life, it's just scriptures from the it's just scriptures from the Quran. We had a dark skinned Mexican Latin soldier with us who I was very good friends with, and um, these people had no idea that there was a race of people on the other side of the people that had, uh, the other side of the earth that had dark skin like they did as well. So these are extremely remote people that do not know a lot of the things that we take for granted and they certainly are not aware 
of the niche American story of like, you know, Bigfoot or whatever. And again, we were having a meeting in which we were discussing the exchange of a large amount of currency for names and information of people that we were potentially going to go and, you know, fight or kidnap or kill. So this is like the, <laughs> this is, I can't stress enough, like how high stakes this meeting is that this person is having. So we're in this little, we're in this little hut. This hut could not have been more than 10 foot by 10 foot. And the old man is sitting on one side of the dish and our uh, leadership is sitting on the other side of the dish and it's covered in rice and bread. And the old man is eating and they're sort of having, uh, I guess you could say pleasantry conversation between the interpreter. The old man has an interpreter as well. And uh, our senior sergeant at the time uh, was an older, more experienced soldier and he had a very heavy Southern accent. And he had a very gregarious, outgoing, friendly personality. And he was sitting there and he said, um, I think, is it, well, he said it clearly as a joke. He said to the interpreter, he goes, hey, man, I'm going to do my best to, uh, you know, <laughs> replicate his accent. He goes, hey, man, hey, why don't you ask this old man if he ever seen, uh, if he ever seen the daggum Yeti up here, man, the abominable snowman, you know? And the interpreter, um, I guess, didn't pick up that it was a joke. So he just said it to the old man. And the old man was eating, uh, and he wasn't making eye contact because out there they don't really have the same sort of food etiquette rules that we have. But the old man was eating, and he was looking down, and he said something, and he made a very dismissive move with his hand, the way that you would be like, ah, blah, blah, get out of here, whatever. And the interpreter uh, turned to the sergeant. He was like, um, yes, of course he knows what you're talking about. And the room just, like, stopped. Like, every, like, everything came to a halt in the room. Like, you could hear the proverbial records scratch. <laughs> and, and everyone stopped. And the senior sergeant sat there for a second. He thought about it. And he goes, hold, hold up, man. And he got real firm with the interpreter. He's like, and he, you know, he, <laughs> he's like, listen, man, I need you to really listen to, to what the f I'm talking about. Are we talk? Are, did that he did he just say to you that he's seen the goddamn Yeti? He's seen a goddamn Bigfoot up here before. And the interpreter was like, "All right, I'll ask him again." He's like, "I want to make it very. I want to because I'm not playing now, man. I want to know what this guy's talking about." So the interpreter turned back to the old man, and the old man and him had a really long exchange in Pashti. And the thing that blew me away was that when this old man was talking to this guy. His mannerisms were the, you know, we spoke a different language and we were from different cultures, but his mannerisms were the exact same as if you and I were extremely annoyed by somebody. He was eating and he had roti in his hand. He had naan in his hand with rice on it. And the, the terp, we call him terps, the terp was talking to him and he did the universal thing. He dropped the food and he went, oh, you know, like that sound you make when you're like, what the fuck? Like he was pissed off. He was annoyed by this guy, right? So he's eating, he's like, listen to this guy, and he kind of looks at him, kind of, he looks at him, he gives him the shitty look, and he's like, Ugh. and he puts his food down, and he, he says to him in a long exchange in Pashti. And what he ends up saying is like, yes, of course I've seen this thing that you've talked about out, out here. I grew, I've been seeing it ever since I was a kid. I grew up with this thing. And I hate this thing. We all hate this thing, because when I was young, we saw it all the time. And it would come and it would occasionally steal livestock and would frighten our women. And when we had chances, we would shoot at it with our, with our Kalishnikovs. And the name that they have for it isn't like, um, it's not some romantic name like, you know, Big Man of the Woods or any shit like that. It's like the, the local name that they have for it is like Dirt Thing or like Pest Thing. It's like a very pejorative name that they have for this. And I'm going to use some strong language here, but it would be like if one of these lived near us and we called it like dirty f or something, you know what I mean? Like they, re they really did not like this thing. And he said, um, during the first Russian war, we started to see X's in the skies. Now, a lot of the, these people don't know what jet air aircraft are. They don't know what helicopters are and things like that. So they would look up in the sky and they would see planes and bombers or fighters and, you know, jet, jet aircraft. And they look like X's. So their colloquial term for aircraft is X's. And he said we would, during the first Russian war, when the Russians were here, and we would see X's in the sky, these things disappeared for a long time. 
And we were glad that they were gone for a long time because we hate them. But then that war ended, and over time they've slowly started to come back, and they were a pest again. They were a nuisance to us. And now that this war has started, occasionally we see exes, and I haven't seen one in a quite a while. But what I want to ask you is, why is this American man asking me about this dirty thing that lives in the woods? And I want to talk about the money and the guns. He was so, he like, and we were in shock. Because this man didn't give a shit that he was telling us about some cryptid. He was annoyed that we were interrupting a conversation that had to do with exchanging large amounts of currency for information that could get him killed to ask him about some pesky animal that lived in the woods that was as normal as anything else to him. And the thing, the way that I look at it would be like, um, you know, if your neighborhood where you live were suddenly invaded by the Chinese, right? And, um, you know, some Chinese special forces and some Chinese agents came and met you at your home. And they were going to offer you $20 million in cash and jewelry and diamonds in exchange for you to give up the names of your friends. And during this very tense meeting, uh, one of them asked you, like, oh, have you ever seen a raccoon? You'd be like, what? Yeah, of course I've seen a raccoon. And then, oh, man, this guy's seen a raccoon. Hold, oh, Are you really? Are you talking about a raccoon? Like, you know, it's got patches on his eyes and little hands. You'd be like, what? Yeah, of course I've seen a raccoon. Yeah, they like eat trash and they live in, they call them pandas. Like, what are you talking about, man? Like, they, I'm not here to talk about raccoons. Like, this, this conversation could get me killed. And his attitude was so, like, uh, like it, it, like, changed the tone of the meeting. <laughs> and the OGA guy, the other government agency guy, kind of had to intervene. He was like, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Look, let's, let's get back on track here. I thought about that moment, and, you know, I, I, I was on multiple deployments to Afghanistan. I've been all over Afghanistan. I've been in southern Afghanistan. I'm in central Ghan. I've been in, you know, CAF and BAF. I've been all over. And I never returned to that extremely remote part of Afghanistan. And that, that conversation that man had, uh, like, really stuck with me. And it kind of became something that was um, talked about in our group for quite a while. And then, um, you know, you get a lot of young A-type men and they're like, oh, well, what would you do if you saw one out there? Like, man, I'd shoot his ass, blah, blah, blah. So, like, um, and it kind of became a little bit of a joke when we were younger. You know, some of the guys like, hey, did you hear about that crazy old man and, the, you know, the Yeti and all this other stuff? And then over time, you know, like, uh, I guess the severity or the seriousness of what we're doing over there takes precedence over some of these little goofy stories that you hear. But I came home and I thought about this a lot. And the thing that tripped me out was that um, there was absolutely no way whatsoever that this man could have known anything other than what he was talking about. Um, I had a buddy over there who was, a, um, who, was who was an intelligence officer. And one time he was showing um, some children in, this, in that same area uh, a picture book that had sea creatures in it. It was like a book that we would show second graders here. And on one of the pages, it had whales on it. You know, there's like blue whale, you know, like a, a humpback whale, an orca. And one of these locals came over and pointed to the book and was like, why are you showing this filth to my children? And the officer was like, no, 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 this is a book about nature, man. Like, this is, you know, these are animals. He's like, this isn't nature. Those, those aren't real. I don't want you showing this filth to my children. I don't, I don't want my children knowing about these lies that you're telling them. So these people are so remote that, like, at least where we were, they didn't have any idea of what a Latin person was. They didn't have any idea that there were large sea creatures. These are very, very isolated people whose only media comes to them directly from the, the, the Quran or what the local, you know, like, provincial person is telling them. And, it's, and, and not only that, but, like, his mannerisms were so... Like, this was not something this man was faking at all. You could tell he was visibly annoyed that we stopped this conversation to ask him about this dirty thing that lived in the, uh, uh, where he was. And, uh, now, and thinking about it more, the area that we lived in is classically, you know, like montane forest where most of the sightings occur. You know, that's, that, to me, that's such an, uh, I don't know, that set me on a path of, of like, knowledge that I, I just had to know more and more about this thing. And then uh, later on in my life, I met a man who had a very close experience and uh, 
Yeah, I mean, there's nothing that will ever happen in my life that will convince me that this this old man was speaking nothing but that the God's honest truth. Yeah, it's an amazing account, Chris, and what an opportunity to sit there and listen to that conversation. And uh, you know, in Afghanistan, it's so closed off. Uh, unless you sit down and talk with a local, you'll probably never even know that these creatures would be there. It would make sense that they're there. It's so rugged. Uh, while you were serving, did you ever run into anything like this out there? Well, you know what? I'll tell you this. I never saw that creature, but I'll tell you, I've been all over the world, and I've never seen anywhere that even remotely comes close to looking like that part of the world. It's That part of the world is so different. It, it looks like an alien planet. It's so vertical. There's no, there's no analog for it anywhere else. Um, so we would go on patrols and we would see something that was like, you know, flatland 500 meters away. And it would take men hours and hours and hours to walk to it because the terrain is so difficult. So, and even with all our TG and our space drones and our Death Star battleship stuff, like that area is never fully going to be penetrated by man. It's impossible to, uh, it's impossible to really like put into words the vastness and the alien sort of like ruggedness uh, of that place. And I mean, I, I don't know what's there, man, but there could be something there in absolute plain sight that no one knows about, or at least the Western world doesn't know about. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it's Afghanistan is one of those places that, I mean, Alexander the Great couldn't conquer it. I'm not really sure why the Russians and why we thought we would go in there and have no troubles conquering it. Uh, it's definitely remote. Tell me about your friend that had an encounter. <laughs> So I came back, uh, I was out in the military a couple of years and, um, I was working for a company, uh, in which we were doing very difficult physical work. And I was working directly under a man who had been a Sergeant first class in the army. His name was Don Anderson. And, uh, he was a long time lifetime native of the Pacific Northwest. And he's one of the physically toughest humans I've ever met and very much maybe arguably the most no-nonsense person I've ever met. This is not a man who had an ounce of empathy or uh, ability to tell a lie in him. <laughs> and um, his father had been a lumber skinner uh, his entire life in the Pacific Northwest. And a lumber skinner is someone who goes out uh, for a lumber company, let's say some, like a lumber company like Warehouser or something like that. And they identify and they mark areas of old growth that can be cut. And they mark trees to get cut. And they mark trees to not get cut. And that, they serve a whole bunch of other roles, too. And I think they're also just regular lumberjacks. But I know that skinning is one of the um, – and I believe that they bring, you know, they bring the machinery that they're going to use and they set up camps and things like that. So they're the most far forward deployed of the um, lumber industry people. And his father had been a skinner for many years. I worked for Don Anderson for years at this job, and uh, somehow one day the subject of my incident that I just told you guys about came up while we were in the work truck together. Some of the guys were ribbing me about it, and they were talking a little bit of trash like guys do. And uh, Don Anderson came out of nowhere, and he told us about his father, and he told us all, and he said that his – now, Don Anderson's probably the toughest, meanest human I've ever met, and Don told us this – that he told us that his father – was the toughest, hardest man he'd ever met in his life. And he said that his father had been a lumber skinner for Weyerhaeuser. And in the 60s, he had been somewhere way deep in Oregon. And he was with two other men. And one of these things walked right up into his camp. And he said it had a white face. And apparently this thing walked up completely fearlessly, approached these men walked up to within 15 feet of them and just looked at them and just stood there looking at them like, Hmm, what are, what are you, you know? And he said, it said that it frightened his father so bad. His father quit the job and he came home and he never went to the lum lumber industry again. And apparently he didn't talk about it to his wife for like decades, but apparently, you know, and this is, and in the sixties, that's really like, I guess the Bigfoot mythos didn't really take off on the West coast till like, I mean, that was still, that was a long time ago. You know what I mean? I guess the Patterson Gimlin film was in 68. I'm not really sure, but, um, 
Yeah, he said his father was a lumber skinner, and one of these things just walked right up into his camp, and he said it had a white face and just stared at him. Like, what the F are you guys? And uh, his father quit the lumber industry that day, and I think I probably wouldn't have too. <laughs> you know, like, you can't blame the guy. And I just, um, you know, I know that no one on who's listening is going to know Don Anderson, but Don Anderson is one of these people where, like, if you meet, if you met Don Anderson even for a minute, you would know that, man, this guy is absolutely not bullshitting. And he said it with such matter of factness that it, it was a little, it was a little surprising. But um, I always remember that. Yeah, he said his father said it had a white face. Yeah, that's a cool account. Kind of feel bad for his dad a little bit. You know, I kind of can't blame him for quitting the job. I probably would have quit the job too, especially back in the 60s. And, uh, you know, the white face is kind of a fascinating detail uh, that he gave. And the behavior is something we hear all the time, you know, them coming in and, and watching. Um, and so you get out of the military, and so you start looking into this subject? I did, and um, I very quickly discovered, at least in my opinion, that there's sort of uh, three camps of people um, who, are, who are involved in the Bigfoot phenomenon. And um, from what I can see, two of those camps are really hurting the, uh, <laughs> the third camp. And I feel as though there's a bunch of people out there who are just, um, they've got some sort of mystical, magical alien connection. They really, I don't know what their, their modus operandi is, but they, they just really want Bigfoot to be some immaterial alien, light phasing, skin walking, you know, monster. I don't even know. And then I think there's a bunch of people out there who, um, you know, like, like a lot of the celebrities we see on television and stuff, these quote unquote insane Bigfoot quote unquote celebrities who uh, are people that just need attention in their lives. You know, like there's people out there who have never accomplished anything. They're self-loathing and they need attention. And these people will say anything for clout and they will do anything for clout and they will make unbelievable claims and they're hurting the community in general. And they always seem to have like really uh don't they seem to always have like um like funny nicknames too? You know what I mean? Like what's up with the nicknames, man? You know what I mean? If you really believe what you're doing, just go by your real name. And um then there's a third group of people who uh I think are trying to collect and collate data and present it in in a really non-arguable form and I think that group is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think that group is really almost at an antagonistic relationship with the other two groups and it's a shame because the more you start to look at like data points and the vast collection of evidence and things like that it becomes obvious that the, at, even if it's not like it becomes obvious that there is or was some form of tangible biological entity that was and or still is roaming this earth because they you know, I'm not going to get into the whole like proving it's real thing, but like uh, the two big groups of quote unquote Bigfoot researchers are doing a lot to really hamstring a small group of people that are basically amateur anthropologists. That's my take on the whole thing. Yeah, I think amateur is a good way to put it. I mean, I agree with you and disagree with you on some points. You know, the Bigfoot world, I do agree with you. A lot of these researchers who seem to be going away lately, uh, I would say over the last couple of years, this is starting to change. And I think it's because new people are coming in uh, to the Bigfoot world or whatever you want to call it. Uh, they're starting to come into this subject and they're not the same type of people I think have been in it for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years. What you'll see with most of those type of guys is they're just tiny men and they really, you're right, they have nothing really going on in their lives. Bigfoot is everything and they lack any sort of self-confidence. So they overcompensate uh, by being dicks, by being jerks, you know, by, by saying they know everything. When in reality, you start asking them follow-up questions and a lot of what they think and say starts to fall apart. I think to your point about it being magical or these claims of, uh, I think he used the term magical, um, you know, until you figure out what Sasquatch is, I honestly believe that you have to hear everyone out. And what's weird in a lot of these bizarre claims, um, I'll give you an example. I 
when I first got into this, people would talk about balls of light. And but it was always an afterthought, you know, like, oh, I have this thing on my property. Here's what it looks like. Here's what it's doing. And oh, by the way, I'm also seeing these weird balls of light on the property. And most researchers won't even bother. I don't even know if research is the right word, whatever, investigator, uh, won't even bother with that. They'll leave that out. They, they want nothing. To, that's got nothing to do with Bigfoot. Well, how do you know that has nothing to do with Bigfoot? Well, Bigfoot's an ape. Well, if you got to figure it out at this point, what what are you doing here? Um, you know, or I would talk to hunters and they would talk about this red, the red eyes. And I would ask them, you know, is it eye shine? Is that what you're, you're describing? It must be eye shine. And they would say, no, these eyes were glowing. So I, in my opinion, I think it's important to hear everyone out. And, you know, even with uh, John Bennernoggle, who is a hardcore scientist, I would bring him weird stuff all the time and say, John, I have no idea. I, I don't know where to go with this. I don't know what this person's talking about. And he would say, it's important to hear everyone out until we actually know what Sasquatch is. You got to hear everyone out, you know, and, and it is fascinating. I'm glad I took his advice because I'll be on the phone with someone and they'll say something to me like on the East Coast. And it's this bizarre uh, encounter and you hang up and you're like, I, I don't know what to think about that. And then four or five days later, you talk to someone on the, the West Coast and they have the exact same it, strange story. And these people haven't talked to each other. You know, it was two separate private conversations. And so that's kind of the point I disagree with you on. Uh, John always had a famous quote, uh, John Benrenogle, that I loved. He told me one time, uh, Wes, if, if one person says they saw the Jolly Green Giant, you can pass it off. That person must be crazy. But if you get 10 people that said they saw the Jolly Green Giant, might want to look into it. And his point was, if you're hearing strange encounters and you're hearing it over and over and over again, look into it. What's the harm in looking into it? And so that's kind of the way I go about it. Um, I do think it's important to hear everyone out. Well, you know, um, I just want to take a minute um, to say uh, rest in peace, John Benernagel. And, uh, you know, I was extremely fortunate enough to have a really beautiful conversation with that man uh, before he passed away. I still actually have his phone number on my phone. And uh, you knew him much better than I did. And I, I think that um, I think if there were more John Benernagels in the world, we could have pushed this down the road a lot farther. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I just, I just want to say, you know, massive, massive respect to, uh, Dr. Bendernagel and like, um, yeah. Yeah. I appreciate saying that John really was the best and he had a great mind on him. I mean, he could talk to you at a high level scientific conversation or he could come down to my level and, uh, we had great conversations together, and there's a lot of shows that have become very, very popular as far as downloads and people talk about, and some of them are some of the most bizarre accounts you've ever heard, and a lot of those would have never aired. I would ask John, what do you think about this? And John would say, yeah, air it, put it out there. I guarantee that person isn't the only person who's seen what they're saying they saw. Um, so he was. Yeah, I love John very much. Um, I want to ask you, you know, and and really no one knows what Sasquatch is. I don't know what Sasquatch is. It could be an ape. Uh, that's what I would like it to be. Uh, but there is some weird stuff that goes on with these creatures. It's hard not to, it's hard to pin, pinpoint it down to something in my mind. Uh, but I always like to ask the guests, what do they think Sasquatch is? And, and there's no wrong answer by any means. Uh, I'm curious, what's your opinion, Jack? Um... Well, I was friends with, and I spent a significant amount of time with um, Snohomish and Puyallup natives uh, when I was in the PNW, and um, I had some very close friends who were both from both of those tribes. And I, I guess for me personally, the tribal um, aspect of it has been a big influence on the way that I perceive it. And um, a friend of mine told me, like, I'm sure you're familiar with the the Stick Indians, you know, which was there the, the a lot of the PNW uh, native people refer to them as stick Indians, but I know that, um, well, at least the, the Piala person that I knew told me about how um, that uh, the lodge where he on the res, where he was meant was in a remote area. 
and I guess like they had to park their cars and then walk up to the lodge. And he said that uh, his grandmother um, had it run in with one of these things, and um, in which she and some other people yelled at it, and I guess it ran off or whatever. But uh, menstruating women weren't allowed to come to the lodge uh, for some of these men because they they thought that it, it attracted stick Indians, right? And to me, that's such a pragmatic data point, and that data point is shared by um like people in different parts of the world like i know that um orangs and chimps can tell if a um if a woman is menstruating or not or not so to me i'm inclined to believe just from the people that i've been around and like you know the data that i've looked at and like i'm inclined to believe that it's it's a I don't think it's a primate. I think it's probably a relic hominid. But I mean, I'm just I'm some amateur who's been into this stuff for a long time. Like my my opinion, it carries about as much water as anybody's. But um, Lloyd Pye said something one time that really like got to me. He said, uh, "Right now, there's probably five thousand Bigfoot tracks, and they're in you know they're either in uh, private collections or they're in, you know anthropological like uh, houses across the world. But we've got about five thousand prints, right? And Every single one of them, even though there's prints with dermal ridges and there's prints with like scarring on them and there's prints that uh, indicate club foots or like uh, there's prints that indicate like uh, a metatarsal break and there's prints that indicate like tailless bone fractures that have healed and things like that. But even though we've got 5,000 of these uh, anatomically correct prints like from all over the world, every single one of them has to be fake. Every single print that's ever been collected by any human anywhere in the world over any period of time has to be fake. Because if one of them is real, then what's the outcome? And to me, I think that's uh, that point stuck with me. That's like kind of the Occam's razor. I, I do think that I do think that they exist. They've got to be beyond endangered. I, I think they exist, and I think they're probably more than likely a relic hominid population. I think the reason that we're not looking farther into this is because if we were to really really delve down into this um it would probably (laughs) like it would probably destroy our nation's lumber industry and i think that's the reason why this thing will remain and is probably um actively stifled by like um the scientific community that's just that's about as fringe as i get i tend to not really want to talk about this stuff in public to people but that's just my take on it yeah you could be right you could be right. I appreciate your take on it, Jack. And I appreciate the fact that you come on the show and, and share everything that happened to you and uh, that incident in Afghanistan. I'm, I'm fascinated by how great would it be to sit down with a cup of tea and have a long chat with that old man, find out what he knows. I, I, don't, I don't think that old man was quite a fan of us being up in his hood. But uh, yeah, I, it would be nice to talk to somebody there on, under, different, under different circumstances. Yeah, hard to blame him for the way he feels. But I appreciate it, Jack. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show, man. I enjoyed talking with you. Thanks, Wes. Thanks for having me. Next up on the show, I want to welcome uh, George. George, thanks for coming on. No problem. And thank you for your service. I know you're a military veteran. You served in the Air Force. Uh, So thank you so much for your service. And part of your encounter actually takes place because of your service to the military. If you would, would you just kind of start from the beginning? Kind of tell us what you were doing and, and walk us into it. I know this is over 40 years ago. Well, my first encounter was um, in uh, Yosemite uh, National Forest in California. I was in the Air Force at the time, and I used to have uh, work six days and then three days off. So during my three days off, I used to go to Yosemite and sequoia quite a bit. So one time I I parked on, uh, if anybody's familiar with that area, parked on a place called Tioga Pass. It's uh, behind the uh, Yosemite Falls. And I found Yosemite Creek, and I started following Yosemite Creek so that I could end up at Yosemite Falls. It took about two, two to three days of walk. And uh, on my first night, uh, I didn't have a tent with me. I had um, 
my sleeping bag. It was a mummy bag, if you're familiar with that. Uh, I, I ate something and and it was getting dark, so I just got into the bag and figured I'd get up early and start hiking again. Just as I got into the bag and, and it got a little, little bit darker, I couldn't I couldn't really see it, so it was it was dark. Um, I heard something coming up on me, and I didn't know what it was. It sounded like it was a uh, on two feet. So uh, I just uh, covered myself up with that mummy bag, and I was completely covered up. And then I felt something like the back hand of something pushing the sleeping bag. And I, I thought it was kind of weird. I mean, I, 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 I can't remember if I was scared or not, but I think I was more surprised because I, I think if it was a bear, it would have forehanded me with its claws. But since it didn't, it kind of, I didn't know what it was. Anyway, you know, it kind of backhanded me several times. It stopped and it walked away. Yeah, I waited two, three minutes. I, I opened up the bag and I looked around, didn't see anything. And I, I was pretty ignorant about the animals that were out there, to be honest with you, because I was from San Antonio, uh, Texas, and I wasn't a, a country boy. So um, I had never been hunting before or out, out in the mountains in the woods. Uh, that was the first encounter. I didn't see uh, anything, but I certainly felt uh, some, what I thought was a, the backhand of something. Yeah, that's definitely unnerving. I guess it is 1978, and uh, you, from you and I talking off the air, you know, it's, you really hadn't spent any time in the woods. You kind of grew up in the city. Two questions I want to ask you. Um, one, was it, did it feel like a human hand, and was it gentle? when it pushed against you? It, it was pretty gentle. You know, it didn't, it didn't push me to where I, I rolled over or, or anything like that. I think what happened was that the bag was so uh, fluffy that as it, as it pushed me, it, it didn't, you know, it didn't touch my body, if you will. Uh, so it didn't roll over, you know, cause I think, um, uh, as it was pushing in, it kind of you know, uh, compressed it, uh, the bag, and then it filled my body. Um, it didn't it didn't roll me over or anything like that. So uh, I would say it was a gentle. It was about three or four gentle uh, pushes. And um, the, what was your second question? Oh, I was curious if it felt like a human hand. Um, and I mean, what's going through your mind? Were you thinking it's probably an animal or? A person at this point, you know. Honestly, I I, I thought it was a human hand because I, I could feel the the fingers, you know, separate fingers. You know, that's why you know it just it felt funny. You know, I mean, it, it was it was really it was really strange. But uh, but I could I remember feeling some some uh, knuckles and fingers, you know, and thinking to myself, well, what's a, a person doing out here? Yeah, George, I'd be unnerved. If I was in a sleeping bag and I thought someone was coming up, touching my sleeping bag in the middle of the night, and I'm the only one there, um, you know, maybe it's better the way you reacted as opposed to how I would probably react. Uh, were you thinking it's best, if it is a person, it's best just to stay quiet and, you know, in case things go south? That, that's what I was thinking. Because I heard it uh, coming up on me, and, and by the time that, that it uh, reached me, I mean, I... I just decided, oh, shit, just be quiet. So I, I just, you know, covered up my, my my face and my whole body was covered up. And and then um, that's when uh, uh, when, I, when I felt the, those hands. I got you. So this thing ends up leaving and there's no more, it, it, there's nothing else that really happens at night. And I know you had a second uh, strange thing happen to you was it in the same area, and was it on the same trip? It was, because, I, like I said, I, I was following the Yosemite uh, uh, Creek, which turns into Yosemite Falls. So it was on the same trip, because I remember uh, going through and, and hiking to Yosemite Falls, and then I, I walked down to, uh, to the valley. And it, by this time, it was raining a lot. So I, I had to make a choice. Do I, do I stay here in the valley or do I hitchhike, hitchhike back to my truck? Because I had parked my truck in the Tioga Pass. 
So I decided I was going to hitchhike, you know, give it a shot. And, and this guy in the, in, the, in the truck picked me up and he went around and this, uh, the, this road uh, it loops around and it comes back up to, uh, behind Yosemite Falls to where I had parked my truck. When I thought that I was getting close to my truck, I signaled the, uh, the guy to, to let me off. He stopped. I got off and it was pitch black. And honestly, I, 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 I can't remember having my flashlight with me. But, but I, I, I felt like, okay, uh, my, my truck's probably in this area here. So I started walking down the road. And to my left-hand side, I, I could hear this, this grunt. And I thought, oh, shit. And the hairs in the back of my head, I mean, they're standing up right now. The hairs in the back of my head just stood up. And, and it, I mean, I, I felt like, oh, my God, there's, there's something there. Because I could hear it, and I could hear it moving around, but I couldn't see it. It was so dark. And, and like I said, I didn't have my flashlight. So I started walking, and then uh, it, it felt like it was coming towards me. And I started running, and I, and I saw my truck. And that was a brand-new truck. And I don't know if you're familiar with the oil uh, in a truck. You like to circulate it, warm it up before you go. I just got in that truck. I turned it on, and I took off like a bat out of hell. Because I, I didn't know what it was. I felt it was chasing me or coming towards me. And I wasn't about to, you know, to stay there and, and figure out what it was. So that was my second incident. And, and again, I didn't see anything that, uh, that time either. But I heard it. I could feel it on, on, on the inside. You know, just, just leave is, is what, I, what I kept thinking. Just leave. Get the hell out of here. Yeah, almost not seeing it as worse. You know, hearing that grunt, you're in the pitch black. Uh, I, you know, I would be terrified too as well. But it didn't really stop you from from going into the woods. Um, tell me about the the very last encounter because I know on this one you actually got a look of of what it was. Um, was it on the same trip? No, the the final one was probably about a month month and a half later. But the, the final one was in uh, Sequoia National uh, uh, Park. And, you know, you got those big redwood trees up there. And um, I had gone hiking all day. I was tired. And I decided, okay, well, it's time to go back to the base. I started driving. And I got so tired that I just said, no, I'm not, I don't feel safe driving because I'll probably fall asleep. So I, I parked on the side of the road, and I do remember that, that there was light. So there must have been a street light uh, on the other side of the, of the road. So I parked, um, and I had a little, that little Chevy Love truck. It had a camper shell in there. So I got in, in the back of the camper shell, and I, and I fell asleep. And then I don't know what time it was i mean it was pitch uh, well it was dark i mean not pitch black because uh, the street light but uh, it was dark at probably two or three in the morning and then uh, i was awoken by by this the the truck shaking side to side and I'm, I'm you know i finally woke up and then i i looked through through the rear window of the, the camper shell and i saw this thing there you know, I, I didn't know what it was, but I could see its hands uh, on, on either side, its arms on either side, holding the, the pickup truck, the camper shell, and, and shaking it. And, and I had, I mean, I had my 30 odd six with me. I had, a, I think it was the 357 handgun. And at that time, um, I didn't know what it was. So I kicked the window, uh, the glass. And, and it startled it, and it stopped, and I saw it squat down. I mean, I, I would say this thing was probably eight feet tall. Uh, I saw it squat down and, and look inside where I was, and I just looked at it, and, and I saw the face. And, um, and it just kind of, uh, its arms went down on the side, and they go to the truck, and it just walked across the the road and it went into the woods yeah i would be terrified something came, coming up and shaking the camper of a truck i'm sleeping in well at that time i 
I wasn't scared. It, it, it was strange because, I mean, you got this big creature shaking my uh, truck, but, but it didn't scare me. It, it was more like, what the hell was that? You know, I'm more curious than anything. I wasn't so curious that I went out the truck, but, uh, but I certainly, I just wasn't scared. Yeah, you're definitely, you're definitely more man than I am, George, because uh, I would have been terrified. Um, can you kind of describe what you saw? I know it's dark and we're going back over 40 years, but we kind of describe what you saw. You know, I've been thinking about it since uh, you and I first talked, and the History Channel has, has that monster quest. And in the beginning of Monster Quest, they usually show, you know, what creatures they're, they're going after. There's a, there's a Monster Quest episode that shows the Bigfoot. It's kind of like uh, almost the same as, as uh, what I'm looking at for, for your symbol, your Sasquatch Chronicles uh, on the screen. Just huge. It didn't have a cone head. It had a, a more of a rounded head. Uh, what I remember is a, a flat uh, face and, and a flat nose, but, but it was just huge. Yeah, and, and again, I realize it's dark, you know, and you're looking at this thing, but uh, with regard to the face, would you say it was more human-like or would you say it was more like a non-human primate? I would say more primate, more, more gorilla-type uh, face. I didn't think to myself uh, that it was human or Neanderthal, or anything, you know, it, it was just more primate. Yeah, and that behavior makes me wonder why they do that. You hear that behavior from time to time. Um, I knew, I know that you grew up in the city and that, you know, you really haven't been out in the woods that much. And again, we're going back over 40 years ago, but what did you think it was? I didn't know what it was. I didn't, I didn't know what to think it was. At that time, like I said, I, I was pretty ignorant about the wildlife that's out there, um, the animals that, that might uh, uh, be out there. Uh, I had never heard of Bigfoot uh, before this incident. I mean, that's how ignorant I was about, uh, about the wilderness. And then all of a sudden I see this thing and maybe that's why I, I wasn't scared because I, I didn't associate it with anything that, that might cause harm. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. I want to ask you about that behavior of it coming up and rocking the truck and kind of get your opinion, George. Um, why do you think it did that? Why do you think it would come up and rock the truck uh, and, and display that sort of behavior? What do you think the intent was? Uh, uh, now that I think about it after, what, 44 years, um, it was probably a territorial type uh, behavior. Like, you know, what are you doing on my, on my property type thing? Maybe a bit of curiosity. Uh, I have no idea. I mean, it, it's just, uh, it, it was aggressive, but it didn't try to smash in the window or anything like that. Uh, it didn't bang on it. It just walked away. Yeah, and I think a lot of people listening to this will go, well, why didn't he just leave? And, you know, you're, you're in a camper, you're in a truck, in the bed of a truck, but there's a camper on top of you, and you almost kind of have to climb out of the camper um, <laughs> to where this thing's at. So I'm assuming that's why you didn't leave. I wasn't about to, to go outside, and uh, I did have a little window that, that you could pass things through between a camper shell and a cab. But I wouldn't have fit, uh, fit through there, so I, I just went back to, to sleep and, and woke up in the morning and, and then left. Yeah, I hear you. You and I are in, in agreement, George. I don't think I would have gotten out of that camper either. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I, like I said, I had a handgun and everything, but I still didn't feel like, like it was, I had given it enough time, you know, just, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't going up. Did this encounter change your life, George? I mean, it's obviously stuck with you after 40 years, uh, but it, did it change your life at all? I think um, I was just more attuned to noises out in the woods. I, I loved going out in the woods, going hiking and camping, and eventually I started hunting. But um, I still go out. I mean, I own property in northern Colorado. I, I love being out in the woods. 
uh, I, th- I think it's just changed my, my perspective about what, what might be out there. Let me ask you, what, what do you think that these creatures are, George? In your opinion, obviously there's no wrong answer, but uh, what do you think Sasquatch is? I think it's a, a descendant of, uh, of a primate, you know, the gigantic uh, Pithecus, the, um, the great apes uh, before uh, the Ice Age. That's what I, uh, I think. I mean, it, it was just so huge. I mean, and, and I don't know if this, if this was the dominant uh, alpha male or, or just a, you know, teenager or, or what. But, but I think they're primates. Yeah, and you could be right, George. I was just telling Jack that, you know, I'd love for it to be an ape. That's what I want it to be. Uh, but no one really knows. And hopefully one day we'll find answers. And, uh, you know, everyone reacts different in encounters. And no one really reacts the same way. I probably would have screamed and ran uh, ran off into the woods, you know, with my tail between my legs. But not everyone reacts that way. And I know it happened over 40 years ago. And I can't think you 